I am so excited for the future of video games. Not because of the inevitable increase in visual fidelity, bigger worlds and more advanced physics. It's because I believe, no, I know that video games have the potential to deliver experiences that are impossible to get in any other medium. Now consider this. Every art form has its own unique language. Music speaks through sound, painting through visuals and dance through movement. Some art forms even combine these elements, like film, theater and of course video games. What makes video games truly unique however is their interactivity. I'm particularly fascinated by the subtle ways gameplay mechanics can convey or deepen the narrative, themes and meaning. This is why I'm so thrilled about what's to come. The medium is still relatively young, not even 7 decades old, and I feel like we've barely scratched the surface of what's possible. Yet, there are already quite a few games that make use of interactivity in beautiful ways, creating experiences that are difficult, if not impossible, to replicate in any other medium. The Last of Us is a game that borrows heavily from cinema. It's largely linear, follows a three-act structure and tells much of its story through cutscenes. This cinematic approach likely contributed to the success of its TV adaptation. However, I think something significant was lost in translation, and that is the small moments of downtime between the big story beats. These breaks are where you truly get a sense of the characters' personalities, mental states and evolving relationships. My favorite example of this occurs in the spring chapter, right after Ellie's traumatic experiences in the winter. Instead of relying solely on dialogue or cutscenes to convey her trauma, the game reinforces it through a subtle yet powerful gameplay moment. Throughout the game, Joel and Ellie have helped each other overcome obstacles dozens of times, using dumpsters, ladders, pallets and so on. A rule has been established. Joel does A, Ellie does B. The game has followed this logic for many hours at this point. And then this happens. Well, we could use that ladder. Everything all right? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, you just kind of seem extra quiet today. Oh, sorry. No, it's not. It's fine. Here we go. Ellie? Ellie? What? The ladder. Come on. Right. Prior to this moment, Ellie had already been more distant in her dialogue. Yet, in this scene, the game goes so far as to disrupt the dynamic that has been established for over 10 hours. It's as if her emotional state is so overwhelming that it seeps into the gameplay itself. The game shows Ellie's state of mind in a way that only an interactive experience can. While the TV show can show her turmoil, the game allows you to experience it directly. The next game I want to talk about also puts the relationship between two characters at the forefront, and that's Brothers A Tale of Two Sons. Brothers is an adventure game that follows two siblings on a journey to save their ailing father after their mother tragically drowns at sea. Before setting off, the village doctor tells them that their father's only hope lies in collecting water from the so-called Tree of Life. As you play through each chapter, you'll find yourself exploring, platforming and solving puzzles along the way. What makes this game unique is its control scheme. You control both brothers at once, with each one assigned to a different analog stick and shoulder button. Though quite jarring at first, it quickly becomes second nature. The brothers are also quite distinct. The older brother is stronger, able to pull levers and boost his sibling to higher spaces, while the younger one is more nimble and able to squeeze through narrow passages. They really have to depend on each other to make it through their challenges. And the gameplay beautifully reinforces themes of resilience and brotherhood. 
The balance between them is mostly equal, except for one thing. The younger boy is afraid of water. After witnessing his mother drown, he refuses to swim on his own. So when they encounter water, he holds on to his brother instead. Now, be warned, the next part contains major spoilers for the game's ending. If you're planning to play the game for yourself, you might want to skip to the next chapter. As the game nears its end, the older brother is mortally wounded by a spider-like creature, leaving him unable to move. Suddenly, my controller feels off, one side unresponsive, a clear reminder of what's at stake. The younger brother races to fetch water from the tree of life, desperate to save him, but it's too late. His brother has already passed. As the boy buries him, an emptiness settles in. For hours, I had guided these two as if they were one, my thumbs working in unison. Without thinking, I tried to use the left analog stick, a habit that now feels pointless. Following the burial, the younger brother makes his way back to the village, carrying the healing water. As he travels home, he comes across a river that blocks his path. Once again, he is confronted by his fear of swimming. I found myself stuck here for a good while, searching for ways to get around the river until it finally dawned on me. What if I pressed the left trigger? What a perfectly executed moment. Throughout the game, it has emphasized that the brothers are stronger together. Losing the elder brother feels like their bond is broken forever, until this pivotal moment of character development occurs. Here, the boy learns to internalize the strength his brother gave him, even though he is no longer physically present, he has become a part of who the boy is. And all of this is conveyed through one simple button press. Speaking of button presses, there is another game that hinges its narrative climax on the relation you've built with its controls. Fumito Ueda's Shadow of the Colossus. In Shadow of the Colossus, our protagonist, Wander, journeys to a forbidden land to revive a girl named Mono by defeating 16 giant colossi, as instructed by a mysterious entity, Dormin. To defeat each colossus, he must climb these giants and stab their weak spots, marked by glowing symbols. Clinging to these massive beings requires holding the R1 button, but Wander's grip is limited by his stamina, shown in the lower right corner of the screen. The button isn't just about clinging on, it also involves timing your release to recover your stamina. Where other games might use an automatic grip or a toggle, Shadow of the Colossus makes this choice deliberate, drawing you deeper into Wonder's struggle. And nowhere in the game is this more apparent than in the final sequence. Massive spoilers ahead. After defeating the final Colossus, Wonder discovers the true cost of his quest. Dormin, the entity he sought out to resurrect his beloved, takes control of his body, transforming him into a monstrous shadow creature. The 16 colossi had acted as a seal to keep Dormin imprisoned, and the only way to reseal him is by throwing Wanda's ancient sword into the shrine's pool. This is precisely what the village elder who had trailed him does. As the sword sinks beneath the surface, a bright light emanates from the water. Bit by bit, Dormant's form is worn down until only a shadow remains in the shape of Wanda. This is where the player regains control. The light acts as a powerful force, pulling at Wanda with an intensity that makes it nearly impossible for him to stand. He struggles against it, but the pull only grows stronger, dragging him ever closer toward the light. Then he reaches the stairs. Instinctively, I press the R1 button, and it works. Wanda clings to the steps, resisting, unwilling to let go. The stamina bar drains quickly. We know it's hopeless, yet we hold on. It perfectly mirrors Wander's own refusal to let go of Mono. But in the end, we too have no choice but to release. What makes this moment so powerful to me is that it's entirely optional. It happens only when you're completely immersed. No button prompts, no voice telling you what to do. It's a quiet, organic moment of storytelling through gameplay, and to me, it's beautiful. Fumito Ueda has created three games in total. The first was Ico, the second was the aforementioned Shadow of the Colossus, and his latest is The Last Guardian. While Ico was a groundbreaking achievement that has inspired many game developers over the years, 
I believe The Last Guardian is his most underappreciated work, especially in terms of using interactivity to tell its story. In The Last Guardian, you play as a young boy who wakes up in ancient ruins alongside a massive mythical creature named Trico. Chained and wounded, with spears lodged in its body, Trico is initially hostile towards you. However, as you remove its chains, tend to its wounds and offer it food, it slowly lowers its guard. To escape the ruins, the boy and Trico must work together. The boy can open gates, squeeze through tight spaces and destroy stained glass eyes that terrify Trico. While Trico can leap across large gaps, fend off enemies and break through walls. What makes this game such an achievement is Trico's realistic AI behavior. Trico acts like a real animal. As the boy, you can offer suggestions, but there's only about a 50-50 chance that it will listen. This can be frustrating at times, but if Trico responded immediately, it wouldn't feel like a real animal. Like any genuine relationship, building trust with Trico takes work. This is where the clever use of the medium comes into play. As you progress through the game, you strengthen your bond with Trico by tending to its wounds, feeding it and calming it after battles. Over time, Trico becomes more responsive to the boy's commands and shows increasing signs of affection. Similar to the scene in The Last of Us that I mentioned, Trico eventually breaks the game's established rules. Game Maker's Toolkit did an amazing episode on this, which I highly recommend watching. However, there is a different moment I want to highlight here, and it's at the very end of the game. Spoilers for the ending ahead. At the end of the game, a severely injured Trico discovers the boy unconscious and determines it's time to bring him back to his home village. Though weakened, Trico manages to fly with his fully healed wings, just managing to clear the valley walls as he carries the boy home. When they finally crash land into the village, Trico gently hands the boy over to his people, the same people who now surround the creature with spears in hand. The boy realizes that if Trico stays any longer, they will kill it. Too weak to explain the situation, the boy has only one option left. In a gesture reminiscent of Shadow of the Colossus, Ueda gives control to the player one last time. Trico won't leave until it knows its friend is safe. And with the same buttons you've used to guide Trico throughout the game, you give it one final command. A cutscene would have worked perfectly fine here, but by having the player perform the gesture themselves, it gives this moment a sense of finality. A last goodbye. Video games often give players some control over the narrative, typically through a choice system, dialogue wheel or quick time event. This already puts games in quite a unique position compared to other mediums. But what about games that adapt in more subtle ways, where changes aren't clearly spelled out to the player? This kind of adaptive design is rare, but when executed well, it adds a layer of immersion that can truly elevate a game to a whole new level. The following games all feature endings that depend on how players interact with the world and its characters. Nowhere in these games are the underlying systems explicitly explained to the player. This approach makes the experience feel personalized, with endings that reflect a player's actions rather than conscious choices. Silent Hill 2 revolves around the protagonist James' mental state. He receives a letter from his wife Mary, beckoning him to the town of Silent Hill. An unsettling twist, given that she's been dead for some time. How you choose to play James will ultimately determine his fate. If James takes a lot of damage and remains injured for extended periods, essentially showing a lack of self-preservation, the game will register this. The same applies to engaging with the more depressing notes and messages scattered throughout. There are other factors, but you get the idea. The game tallies points that lead to an ending centered around guilt. Conversely, if you show concern for James's well-being, by keeping him healthy, avoiding the negative notes and messages, rereading Mary's letter and occasionally looking at her photograph, 
you are more likely to receive an ending that reflects acceptance and moving forward. I don't want to spoil more than necessary, so I'll leave it at that. A narrative that suddenly changes based on your actions is incredibly compelling. And for repeat playthroughs, it offers a fresh way to engage and deepen your investment in the character. While it's not a perfect system, I absolutely adore the concept. Unfortunately, I'm only aware of one other game directly influenced by this system, the excellent Signalis. Consider it a little bonus recommendation. The Witcher 3 receives praise for nearly every aspect of its design, and in my opinion, deservedly so. However, I think the way the game determines its main ending is often underappreciated. Let me explain. The game features many potential end states, each reflecting different parts of the story, but at its core is the relationship between Geralt and his surrogate daughter, Ciri. This relationship ultimately determines the main ending. The way it unfolds is shaped by seemingly small interactions throughout the journey. Unlike many other games, where a single obvious turning point dictates the ending, The Witcher 3 takes a more nuanced approach. The game carefully tracks your interactions with Ciri, influencing her sense of self. By supporting, guiding and encouraging her, you help Ciri grow more confident. On the other hand, being overly protective or distant can make her feel unworthy, which affects both their relationship and the outcome of the game. This dynamic makes Ciri feel like a real person, rather than merely a plot device, and highlights CDPR's deep understanding of the medium's strengths. The last game I want to discuss which features a unique ending based on your actions is Metro 2033. I believe it comes closest to the high standards set by Silent Hill 2. While it is slightly less effective due to the lack of nuance, it is still a very cool feature. The game includes a hidden morality system, where certain actions either add or deduct points from your total. The expected actions are here, such as sparing enemies, choosing stealth over firefights and helping NPCs. But the game also rewards you for engaging with its world and being open-minded, rather than simply following orders. You earn points for playing the guitar, listening to an officer give a speech, talking to your dad, exploring areas off the beaten path, and so on. If you reach a certain threshold of morality points, you can unlock an ending that reflects the more pacifist and curious nature you've demonstrated throughout the game. That said, there is a drawback. The threshold is quite high, 50 points to be exact, which means that only about 9% of players actually manage to unlock this ending. Additionally, the system feels a bit too binary. You either achieve 50 points or more and earn the good ending, or you fall short, even by just one point, and receive the bad ending. But overall, it's a really awesome system, especially since it's hidden from the player. If you know of other games that use this type of player tracking, please let me know. And while we're on the topic of hidden mechanics, it would be criminal to skip over Bloodborne. It's one of those rare games that fully embraces its identity as a game, with almost every element from gameplay mechanics to story details having some sort of in-world explanation or lore implication. It's absolutely mind-boggling. Very little in Bloodborne pulls you out of the experience. However, the one mechanic that stands out as truly unique and almost impossible to translate to any other medium is of course the insight system. To truly grasp how important it is to the game, you first need to understand the kind of horror that's at the heart of the experience. Bloodborne centers around cosmic horror, emphasizing fear of the unknown and incomprehensible over more traditional horror elements. The insight system captures this concept on three levels, thematically, narratively and through gameplay. It's woven seamlessly into the very fabric of the game. So, insight is a resource you accumulate by encountering things that should not be seen, witnessing certain enemies and events, or consuming special items like madman's knowledge. As you gain more insight, the game undergoes various changes, some subtle, others more pronounced. Enemies become more grotesque and dangerous, eerie cries echo through the air, the music shifts, and at 40 insight you experience the game's biggest revelation. Immense cosmic beings, known as the amygdala, have been watching you the whole time. As your understanding of the world deepens, so too does your exposure to its true horrors, evoking a sense of paranoia and dread. This perfectly aligns with the theme of the dangers of delving too deeply into things beyond human comprehension. Insight also serves as a narrative device, compelling the player to actively engage with the forces at play making them an active participant rather than a passive observer. 
On a gameplay level, insight impacts how quickly you accumulate frenzy, especially when encountering the Winter Lantern enemies. Reinforcing the Lovecraftian theme of going mad from witnessing things that should not be seen. It also functions as a currency to summon other players or purchase specific items, which can be interpreted as a trade-off between seeking help and enduring the mental degradation that comes with it. Every element I just mentioned requires input from the player. Sure, you could depict these changes in a TV series or write about them in a book, but by having the player actively set these changes in motion, it becomes much more effective at aligning the game's protagonist with the person holding the controller. I could talk about this stuff for hours, but I think you get the point. Bloodborne simply wouldn't work as well as it does if it were anything other than a video game. One thing that games excel at is playing with character perspective. In many games, you step into a character's shoes and see the world from their point of view, creating a highly immersive experience. Still, some games take this concept even further, exploring perspective in unique and innovative ways. The next three games I'll discuss all play with perspective in ways that are enhanced by interactivity. And yes, I'll gladly take any opportunity to talk about Spec Ops The Line again. Spec Ops The Line is a military shooter that follows Captain Walker and his two squad mates as they descend into a sandstorm ravaged Dubai. At first it presents itself as a typical third person shooter, but it is far from that. You see, Walker is an unreliable narrator, and by the end of the game it is revealed that Colonel Conrad, the man Walker had been chasing throughout, has been dead since the moment they first set foot in Dubai. As Walker's state of mind deteriorates, he begins to hallucinate. This is where Spec Ops truly benefits from being a video game. The game is filled with subtle details that foreshadow Walker's psychosis, many of which either require the player's input or are integrated into the environmental storytelling. It begins with hallucinations of the Colonel's face, appearing at various moments. As you progress through certain levels, these visions sometimes fade. The same goes for a specific tree. When you first walk past it, it appears alive and well. But if you turn around, it is revealed to have been dead for quite some time, suddenly foreshadowing the Colonel's fate. Similarly, when you rappel down a rope, you can see the reflection of a hanging man. An impossible sight, as there is nothing to cast such a reflection. The game is full of these moments, gradually becoming less and less subtle, until you can no longer deny what's right in front of you. In some instances, these hallucinations even change based on your actions, which is absolutely brilliant. Spec Ops The Line is truly a special game, one that I could have placed in any category throughout this video. It features moments of meaningful mechanics, implicit choices and a clever use of perspective. It's a game that really opened my eyes to the possibilities of interactive storytelling. Speaking of eye-opening experiences, imagine this. What if one day you opened your eyes and found yourself in a different body? Would you still be you? Some kind of hybrid or something else entirely? What is consciousness and what does it even mean to be human? These are the kinds of existential questions raised by the horror game Soma. The way the game uses the first person perspective to explore these themes is almost laughably simple, but genius at the same time. To understand how, let me give you a quick summary of the story. In 2015, Simon Jarrett survives a car accident, but suffers severe brain damage. He agrees to undergo an experimental brain scan, only to wake up in 2104 at the Pathos 2 facility, one year after a comet devastates Earth. Over the course of the game, Simon learns from a woman named Catherine Chun that humanity is nearly extinct and that he is now a brain scan of his original self, uploaded into a robot body. The last hope for anything human to escape Earth is the Ark, a digital black box designed by Catherine. It houses a simulated world, where the brain scans of all the Pathos 2 personnel have been preserved. Despite being completed, the Ark has yet to be sent into space. The mission is clear, recover the Ark from the bottom of the ocean and save humanity. The reason I think the first person perspective works so well in this context is because we as humans experience life as a continuous chain of events. We are either conscious, perceiving the world through our eyes, or unconscious, with no recollection of what happens during that time. For example, when we fall asleep, it often feels like we instantly wake up the next morning, because that's when we regain consciousness. 
In Soma, we never leave the first person perspective. From the moment the game starts until the credits roll, we see everything from Simon's point of view. The game goes out of its way to make it as easy as possible to identify with Simon, as if you, the player, are looking through his eyes. First, you learn all the revelations at the same moment Simon does. Second, there are numerous objects to pick up, examine and interact with, further enhancing immersion. And finally, there is no heads-up display to pull you out of the experience. These are all fairly common features in horror games, you might say. And you would be right. But it is the way the game subverts your expectations that reveals its true genius. Throughout the game, questions are raised such as If your entire brain were scanned and transferred into another vessel, would you still be the same person? And at that point, are you even a person at all? This all culminates into a moment that happens about two thirds into the game, where Simon has to switch from his diving suit vessel into a sturdier power suit to continue descending toward the bottom of the ocean, where the Ark resides. I don't want to tell you what to do. What would it be like before? Close my eyes and then... And then open them again. All right, let's do it. Thank you, Simon. Go sit in the pilot seat. By this point, we have a decent idea of how the process works. But it doesn't take long before we find out exactly what it really means. Sorry about any discomfort. This should be over soon. It's like having a picture taken. But with the most expensive camera in the world. You know, Indians thought photos would steal their souls. In this case, they'd be right. <laughs> Without interruption, we switch to the new body. What was that? No, I, it's just... Why was it still talking? It's the same like before. Catherine, why was he still talking? It turns out the process isn't a true transfer, but a duplication. Meaning there are now two versions of Simon existing at the same time. In fact, this had already happened once before, 100 years ago, when the first brain scan was created. The only difference is that now you can actually see your old self. The reason I think this moment is so well executed is because we, as the player, remain in control of the camera, reinforcing the feeling that you are still the same being. Walking up to the original Simon is as horrifying to you as it is to the new Simon. While the perspective may have shifted, it feels instantaneous, much like waking from sleep. This illusion of continuity is what led us to believe we suddenly woke up in this underwater base in the first place, even though the real Simon died back in 2015. Eventually, you reach the bottom of the ocean and prepare the Ark for launch. The final task is to transfer Catherine's and Simon's minds to the Ark and leave the ocean behind. Because the game has already shown the transfer process twice before, you as the player expect to wake up on the Ark. But this isn't what happens. Instead, the same thing happens again. It isn't a transfer, but a copy. This time, however, you remain with the Simon on the ocean floor, rather than shifting perspective to the new Simon on the Ark. Just like The Last of Us and The Last Guardian, the game breaks its own established pattern here. In every instance before this, we followed the copied Simon, creating a false sense of security. But at the most pivotal moment, the perspective doesn't shift, subverting that expectation and ending the game on one of the bleakest notes I've ever seen in gaming. Alone at the bottom of the ocean. Fuck this! Fuck! Fuck this! Fuck you! Fuck you, Catherine! You lied! And I believed in you! I trusted you! You said we're getting on the fucking Ark! We are on the Ark, you idiot! I didn't lie! I can't be responsible for your goddamn ignorance! You fuck! <laughs> Catherine? Please don't leave me alone. Catherine? Catherine? 
When I first read about Road 96, it was described as a road trip simulator, in which you play through procedurally generated areas, eventually reaching the border to escape an authoritarian country, with a strong emphasis on the journey and the connections you make. A digital road trip sounded right up my alley, so I bought the game and thoroughly enjoyed my time with it, meeting interesting characters, listening to the amazing soundtrack and making decisions on how to survive day by day. But then, about an hour into the game, I reached the border. Confused as to why I was already at what seemed like the end, I chose a path to escape and eventually succeeded. Then I began to wonder. What if this wasn't the only journey? What if it was just the first? And that's exactly how the game is structured. In Road 96, you play as different teenagers trying to cross the border, meeting the same cast of characters and influencing their stories. Here, you aren't the protagonist. Instead, you're one of many people these characters encounter along the way. The cool part is that with each run, you can subtly influence these characters and the world around them, leading to significant changes by the end of the game. It's a clever use of perspective to tell a story about change and how a single voice may seem small, but the voices of many can create a powerful impact. And while I think the game didn't really stick the landing, I applaud developer Digix Art for doing something different and pushing the medium forward. When it comes to pushing the medium forward, any discussion would be incomplete without mentioning Outer Wilds. It is a game that's best experienced blind, so if you're even slightly interested, skip to the next chapter. This is your spoiler warning. Outer Wilds places you in the role of an astronaut, exploring a miniature solar system. The game begins with you waking up on your home planet, Timber Hearth, as a new member of Outer Wilds Ventures, an organization dedicated to space exploration. Shortly after, you discover that every 22 minutes, the sun at the center of the solar system goes supernova. Upon each death, you wake up again, repeating the cycle in a Groundhog Day style loop. The entire game revolves around exploration and knowledge. From the moment you gain access to your ship, you're free to go anywhere you want. There's no set objective, no one telling you what to do or where to go. It's just you and your curiosity. As you explore, you'll find ancient texts, and soon questions will arise. The beauty of Outer Wilds, and the reason it could only ever work as a video game, is that it's totally non-linear. The game encourages players to choose their own path, explore at their own pace, and follow their curiosity. It's a game of trial, error, and experimentation. Outer Wilds steps into a sense of wonder and awe through its moments of discovery. Every mystery you solve feels deeply rewarding, because it's you who figured it out, without relying on anything external. And while the game is about black holes, supernova and time loops, it's also a story about connection and shared experiences. A work of art I won't soon forget. Now, if we take the theme of connection and shared experiences and build an entire game around it, we arrive at Journey. This is another game best experienced without prior knowledge. It's a short game taking about two hours to complete. So if you're interested, I highly recommend playing it first and then returning to this video. Full spoilers ahead. In Journey, you play as a nameless robed figure on a pilgrimage to a towering mountain in the distance. The game has no voice work, text or UI elements. Its story is conveyed entirely through audio, visuals and player interactions. The gameplay mechanics are simple. You can jump with one button and emit a musical note with another. You also wear a magical scarf that allows you to briefly fly. Though this consumes the scarf's magical charge, represented by glowing runes along its length. The scarf's runes are recharged by being near floating pieces of red cloth. So, what makes this atmospheric platformer so special? Its beauty lies in its multiplayer component. The game can be completed entirely solo, but if you're connected to the internet, you may encounter other players on their journey. Together, you can choose to continue as companions or part ways at any time. Players remain completely anonymous, with the only form of communication being the musical chirps. However, traveling together offers advantages. Players can recharge each other's magical scarves, guide one another through the environment, or activate strips of cloth to progress. What makes Journey stand out is its departure from typical multiplayer mechanics like competition or clear objectives. 
Instead, collaboration happens naturally, with the only shared goal being to reach the top of the mountain. Before long, most players fall into a natural rhythm. They share discoveries, wait for each other and help one another when needed. Over time, an unspoken bond forms, creating a unique and personal connection between the players. As you get closer to the mountain top, the journey becomes tougher. Cold winds threaten to blow you off the mountain, and giant creatures try to stop you. During these moments, the game adds another incentive to stick together, by giving players the option to keep each other warm. I can only speak for myself here, but once I've started the game with someone, I feel compelled to stick together until the end. Inevitably though, both players freeze. When I first played this, I thought it was game over, but then this happens. You get revived by these cloaked figures and ascend into the sky. In that moment, I couldn't care less about my own fate. I just wanted to see if my companion made it too. And when I reached the top, there they were, flying by my side. It's such a simple story, one that anyone can understand. And that's exactly the point. You don't know who's holding the controller on the other side. But through the interactive medium of video games, it creates empathy and collaboration without a single spoken word. This idea leads me to the final game of this video, Nier Automata. For me, it remains unmatched in how it fully embraces the unique potential of its medium. It's a game set in a distant future, where Earth has been overrun by machine lifeforms created by alien invaders. Humanity has fled to the moon, leaving behind androids to combat the machines and reclaim the planet. You play as one of these androids, called Tubi. What makes this game so brilliant in my opinion is how it uses typical gaming conventions not just as gameplay mechanics but as integral parts of its narrative. It often recontextualizes these conventions in creative and meaningful ways. For instance, very early in the game 2B must calibrate her systems before heading out on her mission. 9S, her support android, helps her with this process. And instead of presenting it through a cutscene or a simple dialogue, the game directly involves you by entering the menu screen. You're required to adjust the settings of the game yourself. This clever approach reveals that the menu screen isn't just for the player, it's actually 2B's operating system. And it isn't just a one-time gimmick, the game treats the menu like that throughout the whole game. Skills are presented as upgrades to 2B's chipset, which has limited storage capacity. What makes this system particularly ingenious is that even individual HUD elements are treated as chips. You can uninstall these elements, like health bars or minimaps, to free up space for other upgrades. It's a smart way to integrate UI elements into the narrative, making them feel natural within the context of an Android's design. The same concept applies when you contract a virus, the HUD starts glitching out. The game is full of these small touches and it really adds to the experience. We're heading into full spoiler territory now. I'm about to talk about one of my favorite moments in gaming, so if you haven't experienced it yet, I highly recommend playing the game first. Before diving into that though, I want to highlight a few more aspects that set Nier apart from most other games. For one, it uses multiple New Game Plus cycles to tell its story from different characters' perspectives. Additionally, the game features moments of implicit choices, like the ones I mentioned earlier in the video. One such moment involves a robot named Pascal, who had just witnessed his entire family die because of something he did. Pascal asks you to either kill him or erase his memory. However, there's a third invisible option, simply walking away. It's a choice that almost no player likely made on their first playthrough, but the fact that the game acknowledges it adds a lot to the sense of immersion. And that brings me to the moment I alluded to at the start of this section. Ending E. The game features multiple endings, so by the time you reach this one, you've seen the credits roll several times. Ending E is the true conclusion of Nier Automata, and it masterfully uses the game's central themes to deliver a powerful message. Once again, the game takes a typical gaming convention, like the credits, and transforms it into something truly incredible. Throughout the game, it's revealed that humanity has long since perished, and the androids are essentially fighting for nothing. One of the central themes is the search for purpose and meaning in a world that seems devoid of both. During the credit sequence, the pods who have served as supportive AI companions to the protagonists throughout the game step in. They have access to the consciousness of our three main characters, and they ask you, the player, if you wish for them to survive. Once you press yes, ending E truly begins. 
You are then thrust into a bullet hell section against the creators of the game. In a story about never ending cycles, this is such a clever way to attempt to break that cycle. There's just one problem. It's incredibly difficult and before long you'll lose. The game then asks you if you want to give up. But of course we don't, because we're so close to the end. Inevitably you die again and again, while the game actively taunts you. But it's not just the game sending you messages. You also receive encouraging words from players who've gone through this before you. Yet, despite the support, you keep losing to the unrelenting bullet hell. And just when you're about to give up, you receive a rescue offer from an actual player. If you accept, a flood of players will come to help you defeat this seemingly unbeatable foe. The music swells and a background chorus joins in, symbolizing the other players. Finally, you're able to break through. When I first played through this section, it felt surreal. I couldn't believe what was happening. It made me appreciate the game on a whole new level. When the last line of text is destroyed, we're treated to a final hopeful cutscene. Afterward, you're given the chance to leave a message for other players, inspiring them to keep pushing, just as others did for you. And then the pod asks you one last question. Pod 042 to player. Please respond to this query. You, faithful player of this title, have lost your life multiple times to make it this far. You have faced crushing hardship and suffered greatly for it. Do you have any interest in helping the weak? Selecting this option enables you to save someone somewhere in the world. However, in exchange, you will lose all of your save data. Do you still wish to rescue someone, a total stranger, in spite of this? The person you save will be selected at random. This is the moment where the reality of the situation truly sinks in. All those players who helped you finish the game did so by sacrificing their save data. They gave up the chance to earn achievements, complete side quests or further explore the world. And this is where the game's themes and interactivity come together perfectly. In a game about the search for purpose and meaning, you, the player, are given the opportunity to give your playthrough true significance by sacrificing all the hours you've spent, simply to give one other person the chance to do the same. And that brings us to the end of the video. If you're still watching, I truly appreciate it. I'm always on the lookout for games that do something unique with their medium. So if you know of any others I should check out, please feel free to leave your recommendations in the comments down below. Liking the video and subscribing to my channel would be greatly appreciated. A big thank you to my Patreons for supporting the channel. If you'd like to join them, the link is in the description. Alright, that's it from me. I'll catch you in the next one. Peace!